Peter served as a national security advisor to President Trump and George W. Bush. David Sanger, national security correspondent for the New York Times, author of the new book, The Perfect Weapon, War, Sabotage, and Fear in the Cyber Age. And Jennifer Jacobs, White House correspondent for Bloomberg News. Welcome to all of you. You guys see our papers blowing around. Got a little wind up here as well. But Martha, let me begin with what we just saw there. You know, the president coming off the G7, allies still united on North Korea. But this is not the standard script heading into a summit like this, this kind of a break. Our oldest allies. Absolutely not. And the name calling, I've never heard anything like that with a U.S. president calling a U.S. ally names, calling him meek, calling him all the things he wanted to call him. But I think you're seeing Donald Trump in the second half of his presidency. And people I have talked to uh, who are close to the administration say, this is what you're going to see in the future. The people who were whispering in Donald Trump's ears before, and H.R. McMaster, he's fired as Secretary of State. Rex Tillerson, those people are gone. He's doing exactly what he wants to do when he wants to do it. He's doing it his way. And I think in the next two and a half years, it won't just be a roller coaster. It will be a steamroller. Yeah, let's bring in Tom Bosser, because you just left that White House I did. Uh, a, 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 as well. And that has been a thing we've seen in recent weeks. The president really becoming his own man inside that Oval Office. Yeah, you know, partly we are. We're seeing him come into his own and feel a bit more comfortable, but we're also seeing a return to the campaign trail, right? This president's keeping promises that he ran on. In fact, this particular conflict and this opportunity is an extension. We've seen him now create a little bit of a trade conflict, but he's going to maintain that same trade conflict pressure on China for their behavior, and he's going to do it in a way that no other president's done, while not appeasing Beijing on their trade needs and moving into the security negotiation with North Korea. No president's done that. No president's been able to maintain that through the talks. So far, this president has. Yeah, the question is, can that compartmentalization hold? And, and, and David, one of the things we're seeing as the president comes here into Singapore for the summit is kind of a managing uh, of the expectations. Very optimistic yesterday in Canada, but earlier in the week and coming into the, he's describing the meeting much more as just a getting to know you meeting, kind of lowering the expectations. He's made this a little bit hard for himself. From the beginning of his presidency, he has said he's going to solve this problem, and he said that every pre previous president has kicked it down the road. Well, he's right. Every previous president did kick it down the road because the consequences of a conflict were so huge. The question now is, as he actually steps into the room with Kim, he's recognizing that this infrastructure that North Korea has built up over nearly half a century is so vast that the early easy campaign talk that we're just going to pack it up and send it to a weapons lab in Tennessee is not realistic. And then the question is, do you end up in a slow process where you're giving something, you're getting something, you get eaten away by the North Koreans the way every past president The question did. is, can he still call that a victory? That's what he's going to want to do coming out on Monday, uh, Monday night in New York, Tuesday morning here. And, and Jennifer, you've looked a lot at what the president, how the president has prepared for this and what to expect as the meeting unfolds. He wants a one-on-one, -on -one, almost totally alone with Kim Jong-un. Right, and that's the plan right now. So he will go in one-on-one, -on -one, according to the current plan. And when I say alone, there will be translators there. Kim has been speaking exclusively in Korean when he's been talking to U.S. officials in, in the preparations. And, of course, that big envelope letter was in, in Korean. So we don't expect Kim will want to be in there, just the two of them. The translators will be there. And I'm told that the president likely is not going to speak, attempt to speak Korean. So... Uh, the translators will, will be there. I, I think the reason for the one-on-one -on -one is they, that Trump wants to get beyond the niceties. He wants to get beyond the diplomatic talk, and he wants to get a feel for whether Kim Jong-un can be trusted, whether he's telling the truth. Uh, he thinks that he's got this guy wired, that he and Pompeo and Andrew Kim really have figured out what motivates Kim. They know he wants security guarantees, that he wants a legacy, very similar to the president. He wants a legacy for himself and for the Kim family. So he really wants to, and he said to us in Canada, I'll know in the first minute if this guy is serious about wanting to get rid of his nuclear arsenal. Let's broaden out the conversation and bring in an expert on Kim. Dr. Jung Pak is joining us from Washington, the head of Korean studies at the Brookings Institution, also served for several years as an analyst with our intelligence community. And, and, and Dr. Jung, talk a little bit about that, the motivation for Kim Jong-un coming into this meeting, what to expect from him. I, I find it hard to imagine Kim giving up his nuclear weapons. Um, we talked about legacy. Um, I think that for Kim, if we believe Kim, he has completed something that his grandfather started and his father nurtured. 
And for him to give that up um, for economic development assistance from the United States, I think would be the height of betrayal to his country and to his uh, his grandfather's legacy. So I think we have to square that circle if we are to believe that Kim is really willing to give up his nuclear weapons. And what more do we know about his preparation, Dr. Pack, whether he'll speak any English to Donald Trump, how off script he's likely to go? Uh, you know, if anything, the, the two leaders who are meeting um, in a, in tomorrow will be uh, our... Um, master disruptors in many ways, where they go off script. I'll point to the inter-Korean summit when Kim and Moon met at that border, and Kim uh, you know, pulled President Moon across to the other side, um, breaking a highly orchestrated event, um, and really for that split second, taking control of that moment. Um, and President Trump is, is the same way, or very similar in that way. So we have two master disruptors in the room. Um, and I think it's going to be really interesting to see what the two can glean from each other in the first couple of seconds. That's right. And Tom Boston, as Dr. Pack was talking, it made me think of that first meeting between President Trump and the French president and that handshake that went on yeah. forever. You see, you have this feeling that both men uh, going into that Tuesday meeting are going to be looking for an advantage. Yeah, and of course, that was a, a partly scripted thing on the French part as well, and I was there for that handshake, but I think in this particular instance, it's wise, and I think good reporting that there's going to be a private meeting first. A number of experts, those that praise the president for doing this, have said, take the North Korean leader aside and try to develop a rapport, as if it's possible. I understand that some believe it's not, but I think it's worth noting that past presidents, past foreign leaders, his own family and his own country have tried these things for different purposes and under different conditions. The practices that brought us to this point of pressure have been coalition, not American-led. And I think it's important to note that. And, and Martha, this is a breaking script in another way. Usually summits like this come after months and years of preparation. The Sherpa's laying all of this groundwork. This one is really a top-down process. Yeah, and he's just thrown out the book on all that. In, in some respects, because the summit was canceled at one point, then the diplomats could come in and do a lot of deal making at that point. So it kind of was inverted at that point. But starting at the top, I think what you'll see is whatever they have, whatever low bar they have, then you'll have the work proceed after that with Laura Levin. But they've learned so much about him, George. Think about it. Before this, before these last couple of months with Mike Pompeo, I think the only American who really had talked to Kim Jong un was Dennis Rodman. Now, History has already been made tonight. We have got him here tonight in Singapore. Kim Jong-un, who no one had talked to before, right down the street. And of course, David Sanger, Kim Jong-un is in this position because he accelerated that nuclear program. He's in this position because he accelerated his nuclear program, he accelerated his missile program, he put the technology together, and he convinced the United States that he would soon be able to strike any American city. He's not quite there yet. It might take a few years. If it wasn't for that, he wouldn't have the leverage that he's got today. And that gets really to the question, George, of what do you actually think could come out of this tomorrow and, uh, or on Tuesday? And, and I think the answer to that is that the president has begun to turn toward his thoughts of a peace treaty before he gets to the thought of what would complete, verifiable, irreversible denuclearization look like. And one of the concerns here is that the president might actually lose sight of some of the denuclearization points because he's a little bit entranced at this point with the thought that being the person who brought peace to the Korean Peninsula is a big deal. Yeah, Jennifer, one thing that's very, very clear, the president, by everything we've seen, wants this summit to succeed. Even though he said he's prepared to walk out, he doesn't want to. Oh, absolutely. And I do think that his strategist said he will walk out. If, if he's not getting a good vibe from Kim, it, his intention really is. But he studied hard and planned for this. He admitted that in his Rose Garden press conference the other day. Um, Pompeo personally walked him through strategy, walked him, talked about Kim's personality, talked about different talking points that he could use. So the president is prepared for this. Um, as prepared as he can be, I think, and he wants this. I know from talking to his administration officials that Obama is very much an, uh, an echo in his, his mind right now. Um, on Inauguration Day, the pre President Obama said, the biggest threat that you're going to face is North Korea. 
and that Trump wants to come out of this with a deal. I've actually I've talked to the president a couple of times about this. It is very, very clear that that meeting he had with President Obama just a couple of days after his election win had a deep impact on him. It really sobered him up. I'm sure you felt that yep. when you were at the White House. I can confirm it. In fact, that from the very beginning, so part of the analysis on his preparation is focused in the short term, but he's been in, set, in a sense, and I think Secretary Pompeo said this from the White House podium, preparing for this since his first week in office. And I think that's my experience. He, he's been taking a almost daily briefing and even in the briefings where we didn't raise this topic, before we left, he raised it with us to and, make sure. And, and he had to. As much as we talk about other presidents who didn't do much and didn't solve this problem, in effect, they didn't have to. Donald Trump had to solve this problem because of the progress that Kim Jong-un has made, because of the fact that he either has one now or very soon could have a nuclear weapon and, that could reach And clearly States. put more pressure on Kim Jong-un by all that blustery talk at the beginning of his term. I want to bring in Dr. Pak uh, again right now. I mean, and Dr. Pat, we know that Kim Jong-un is running uh, one of the most brutal police states in the world right now. He uses assassination as a tool. He uses forced starvation. Is there any prospect that coming out of this meeting, he is open to changing his ways, or is that just not on the table? Uh, you know, I think um, one of the reasons that North Korea comes out so uh, viciously against any talk about human rights, any criticism about North Korea uh, human rights violations um, is because repression is a requirement for um, reinforcing the regime. Um, why do people go to these uh, gulags or to these prison camps? It's because they speak ill of the Kim family or they are not uh, sufficiently reverent enough or they speak out against the, the uh, regime or they engage in market activities that the, that the uh, regime says is not acceptable. Um, so I think um, repression is a part of North Korea's regime identity, um, and they need it for the, um, to make sure that the Kim dynasty remains. Um, and that's why the North Koreans are so uh, viciously against uh, any talk about human rights. Now, if, but if that said, if Kim is really sincere about giving up his nuclear weapons and really doing a strategic pivot, um, then that would be one of the signposts that we would be looking at to make sure that Kim is actually sincere. But so far, um, we have yet to see any uh, big changes in the way Kim uh, conducts his own domestic governance policies. And David Sanger, the big, the big incentive for Kim here, obviously economic growth, more economic aid, the idea of bringing North Korea into the modern world. So... The balancing act, George, that he's got to do is, on the one hand, he knows he needs more of this development. If he's going to rule Korea for a long time, he's only 34 years old. He could imagine staying in power for 40 years as his grandfather did. He also can't imagine staying in power without those nuclear weapons, because in the back of his mind, he knows that it's the existence of those weapons that is the only reason that people pay attention to North Korea, back off from North Korea, and keep North Korea from collapsing. And so I, he'd like to make this an arms control talk. I'll give you some, but not all of them. And, and the question, Tom Boster, is one, is that enough of a victory for President Trump and the United States? Is it a victory for the world? Also, what else do you expect the president and his team to put on the table here with North Korea? Yeah, I think that's important because I believe the scope of this is bigger and the stakes are a lot higher. I think that whether either leader believes it to be the case that going into this and coming out of this summit we're looking at the potential realignment of American interests and American presence in this region and maybe in the world. Remember, the Korean conflict and the Korean War and the subsequent long-standing armistice has, has been really the reflection of the, or emblematic of that which this president ran against, or at least ran to, to recalibrate. I don't think this president ran to withdraw troops from around the world, as is sometimes reported, but I think that's his instinct to recalibrate in favor of local regional investment. What we're going to see come out of this is bigger than an arms race. It's probably bigger than a denuclearized conversation on the peninsula. It has to do with American troop presence in this region. The West Pacific might hang in the balance. That's if there's a success right there. Martha, one of the things we also have to address, if this fails, we have very few other options right now. The military options front and center one more time. It, it, it always is, and you've heard President Trump talk about that a lot. They clearly not backed off, but we're not hearing anything about the military anymore. I, I think what you see here and what we'll have here is some success, but it's like planting a seed. 
we won't know for a long time whether there's actually success from this. Even if they start talking about denuclearization, it takes a long time to make that happen, and it takes a long time to prove that it actually did. The president's salesmanship will be uh, attested as well. Can he redefine denuclearization, I guess, would be one of the questions. Yeah, and he'll figure out some way to come out of this successfully. He and Kim both love theatrics and hyperbole and military parades and, and big cheering crowds. They have a lot of things in common, so I think that they will probably strategize something. I know the president intends to go in there and really try to reassure Kim that the U.S. will protect, he'll say protect, and that Japan and China will be there to cover their, their financials, you know, help them financially if, if need be. He's going to go in there with, with some reassurances. They'll come out with something. I, I have a feeling that we'll see something about the end, the technical end of the, of the Korean War after these, some 65 years. So there will be something that, hey, solid. That comes David, out. you described it as, as arms control, not getting rid of the weapons. If you're dealing with arms control, that's not all that different from the 1994 agreement that President Clinton got with the North Koreans. It's not all that different from the process that George W. Bush embarked on in 2005, 2006. The question is, what will be different after this meeting? Well, in 1994, North Korea had not yet exploded a nuclear weapon. Today, what the president has to do is get the North Koreans first to turn over all those nuclear weapons or dismantle those weapons. But then he's got to do something harder. He's got to get them to take apart all the production facilities. And having complained that the Iran deal was a terrible deal, he's got to do better than what Barack Obama got in the Iran deal. And what did he get? He got 97% of the nuclear fuel out of the country and got less than a bomb's worth of material and equipment still spinning. If the president doesn't get at least that, he hasn't met his own test. And that's going to be a very hard but, one. But uh, I was just saying, it, it, it seems almost inconceivable to me that, you, that Tom Bosch, you get anything close to the Iran deal, at least anytime soon. Well, I don't know. There's a little bit of a dis disagreement or disjunctive kind of conversation here, because if, if I'm hearing you right, getting rid of the anywhere from 20 to 30 or more warheads that they have in their possession would be a significant reduction. It'd be of, a big of, reduction. And so at this point, I think that would be in the category of big success. Then the second question would be whether we can maintain that long tail of production and manufacturing capability to include their knowledge base and the scientists that could just recreate this program over time. I think that's the part that takes a long, thoughtful time and the true presence to guarantee their security. But if I could, I think that there's really only one failure that comes out of this. The failure is a lack of co cohesion in this coalition. I mean, in other words, even if there's a failure in the, in the conversation and they walk out and have a disagreement over their objectives, at least we've learned something there. I don't suggest that even failure is, suge is success, but I do suggest that there's an, a learning opportunity here. If the president sees that he's not serious, he's really saved us a lot of time, money, and effort. So the difference between the Clinton era, which was also bilateral direct engagement that should be lauded, and this attempt is that it's not just bilateral. He's looking for irreversible, <coughs> irreversible demonstrations of denuclearization. And, and I want to bring that final George question. Bush too, as well. George Bush didn't get to that point. He started a multilateral effort, and they advanced under his watch. And so sanctions didn't work. Multilateral approaches led by China didn't work. I think this president's got a lot more in common with President Clinton in this regard. But I do think that coming out of this, and, and some experts have gotten it wrong. I've said to you last week on the show, Suggesting that they can't take immediate irreversible steps is maybe a miscalculation. Well, let's let's take a final question then, Dr. Pack. What is success for Kim Jong Un? Is he ready to take those steps? Um, I think Kim can already rack up some successes. Um, he has met twice with President Xi Jinping of China. He has met twice with uh, President Moon of South Korea. He has President Assad from Syria looking to visit visit him in Pyongyang. And he has uh, Putin, a, p a potential uh, meeting with Putin at some point in the future. So um, I think uh, just by virtue of having having made this engagement pivot um, and the and the U.S. president agreeing to meet with Kim, um, in effect, what we have is that the spigot has turned on for greater international engagement, um, economic, political, otherwise, that boosts Kim's legitimacy. So in that way, um, you know, Kim can rack up that sort of win. Um, and I think, you know, for, for, for our part, I think what's good is that we have a de facto moratorium on missile tests and nuclear tests. So, so we should take that, but also see how much we can push Kim on, uh, on further um, concessions. You all have laid out the issues very well. Thank you very much.